but I'll get us, get us started now. Um, but just introduce myself. My name is Maddie Nickel. I am the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement for Penn Nursing. So I'm the point person for all things alumni, alumni weekend, homecoming, um, anything you can think of that falls under me. Um, but I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Um, it's very exciting to see everyone here. I know we have some students registered, alumni, faculty, staff, friends. So it's really wonderful um, to be here with all of you tonight. Um, as you know, uh, this is our first event in a five-part series um, between Penn Nursing and Project Knitwell. Um, we're very, very excited about launching this uh, event series and we're happy to have you all here with us as we begin that. Um, like I mentioned, it's the first of five sessions, um, which will run from now through February. Um, more information will be on our website and things like that, and I'll share more at the end, but just so you're all aware. Um, but uh, as you all, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to have a presentation and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Um, feel free to either put questions in the chat or when we do get to that portion, you feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions out loud. Um, we'd love to hear from you. But uh, I will now hand things over to Lauren, who is the Executive Director of Project Knitwell, who will be sharing with all of us today. So, Lauren. Thank you so much, Maddie. I'm so happy to be here with all of you tonight. As Maddie said, I work with Project Knitwell, and I'm so happy today to see all of the questions that you submitted ahead of time that are so research-oriented. Um, my heart really lies in the sciences. I worked for many years at Brown Engineering, helping in the communications office, and working at colleges and universities is really my foundation, and I've been really really lucky to uh, learn a lot about uh, the science of knitting. And I want to share some of that with you today, but I also want to give you a little bit of the background of what Project Knitwell is all about. And I joke with my family and friends uh, that if I could put up these billboards in real life, I would do that. Uh, and part of our outreach at Project Knitwell is helping people understand better why knitting is so good for you. And hopefully increasing the number of new knitters while at the same time encouraging those of you that may already know how to knit to do it more often. So uh, knitting truly is a wellness tool. It's a tool that I've used throughout my life um, and I feel very strongly about the benefits of knitting. I have another slide of billboards that I, um, these are just fake billboards that I created but I think it's really fun to think about um, having opportunities to teach people and opportunities to give them more insight into what knitting can do for them. So that's what we're going to do here tonight. And I'm especially excited that um, most of you come from a nursing background because we have found such success today, uh, just today on the uh, first day of fall, I was with a group of nurses and doctors at Georgetown uh, University Hospital MedStar and uh, it was really a great opportunity to um, connect with new knitters that are ready for the fall to cozy up and learn a little bit about um, how they can share knitting amongst themselves and also with their patients. So um, at Project Knitwell, one of our um, one of our primary foundational pieces is knitting with a purpose, wellness, comfort, and community. And I think of those three parts as rooms in a house. And when we think about um, how we prepare ourselves for, um, and how we comfort ourselves, like what is our self-care routine, that is really the wellness piece. So how can we prevent uh, any problems from occurring uh, in our mental health? And what sort of preventative measures can we take uh, to have knitting ready and waiting when we feel that point of stress? Um, so that preventative piece is really important to what we do and how we provide uh, that as a service. And then also our foundation truly lies in the moment of comfort. 
So uh, we are, have a foundation of working in NICUs, in waiting rooms, across uh, cancer facilities in the DC area and beyond. And that comfort moment where you're able to use knitting and the process of learning to knit as a soothing tool is really, really crucial to what we do. And then the room above all of that, uh, we, that really nourishes all of this is the sense of community and the support that you can find within the fiber community, I think is really, really um, one of the most wonderful parts about knitting. Throughout history, there has been so many um, points where knitting circles have really bonded communities together and given people the opportunity to meet people that uh, share an interest but may come from very different backgrounds. So I think the community that we're building both online and in person is really crucial and um, important to what we do. So you might notice throughout my presentation, I have QR codes in the bottom of some of the slides, and you're welcome to put your camera up to the screen and scan in for a link that tells you more about that particular aspect. So this particular QR code would link you to a, um, an explanation of our mission on our website and give you a little bit more insight into the rooms of our house. So I invite you to use those QR codes. There's a um, research padlet at the end that gives you links to all of the research articles that I'll mention today. Um, and I think it's a nice way for me to share that as we go along. So um, feel free to use those QR codes and we'll obviously also follow up with the direct links as well. So, um, so no pressure if you don't feel like it's easily coming up for you. So one of the aspects to Project Knitwell um, is our foundation started in 2010. Uh, we became a formal nonprofit that particular year, and we grew from one hospital and one volunteer to providing services across uh, six different hospital systems and 20 community sites. Uh, we serve a wide variety of community groups, um, not just in arts and health, but also beyond. So working with students in the um, different educational settings for uh, students with special needs. We work with a group of women that were recently incarcerated and are transitioning back to the workforce. Uh, those struggling with homelessness, uh, coping with grief. Uh, we have a group, uh, two groups now of Afghan refugees in this area um, and low-income senior citizens. So it's really important to us that we have that outreach and we're looking at how can we connect with groups at a point of stress and at a point of transition. And one of the pieces to that is figuring out um, what the purpose of our presentation really is for that particular particular group. So our, um, our goals really shift depending on who we're talking to. And our goal tonight is to really focus in on healthcare. And at the end, I'll, I'll dig into some of the aspects to um, what we can do to help prevent burnout and compassion fatigue, especially um, in um, nursing, teaching, uh, quite a few fields right now. So, so that's really crucial to us. So what is knitting? If we think about the really fundamental root of what we're hoping to accomplish, it really is fundamentally sticks and string, right? And Stephanie Pearl McPhee, who's a very popular author, I like to call her the knitting comedian. Uh, I love hearing how she um, defines things, how she says things. She has some great videos online also, so I invite you to take a look at, at her community. She's Canadian, um, and she, uh, I think, does a great job in her books of giving a, um, a lot of insight, but in a um, comical way, and um, she's just a real character. So I invite you to, um, to get to know her if you're interested in kind of what knitting means to her as well. So one of the crucial aspects, and really what I think is the most fundamental to knitting, is the use of our hands. And how we use our hands is truly so crucial to our well-being. And nowadays, we use our thumbs to scroll a lot, right? We're using our hands a lot less. Our, our children are using their hands a lot less. And um, the one thing that is so compelling about using both of your hands in unison or in a rhythmic motion 
is that you're igniting over 60% of the surface area of your brain. So the fact that you're able to do that uh, and you're really creating new neural pathways and you're really able to focus on the plasticity of your brain um, when you're learning initially and when you're learning a new skill and you're concentrating on your knitting is really crucial to how our hands develop. Uh, this book by Frank Wilson called The Hand is really a very provocative uh, insight into how using our hands has not only shaped our brains, but it also has shaped our human culture. Uh, so I'd invite you to take a look at that if you're interested to hear from sort of an anthro anthropological analysis really of how knitting, ha not knitting specifically, but in general using our hands has um, really focused on increasing our manual dexterity and our eye hand coordination. Um, knitting also has the added benefit Many believe that it can prevent arthritis and tendonitis by keeping our joints lubricated, um, keeping that stiffness away. So maintaining the structural integrity of, of our cartilage, um, it's not something that would wear out. Um, it's something that the more you use it, the stronger it stays and the structural integrity stays intact. So I think knitting really is uh, beneficial to our fundamental physical traits like that and the use of our brains overall. I really feel like one of the pieces that I get most excited about is thinking about knitting not just in the concrete sense, but also in a more abstract sense. So I am um, all about a good metaphor. I, I love a good pun also, but these are essentially metaphors for what knitting can feel like uh, for different individuals and what it is that you're trying to get out of being part of a knitting community can be different different for quite a few people. So if you think of knitting as a parachute, uh, it's a tool that you can be prepared to float down to safety um, if you're required to leap into that next new challenge. So you have that parachute ready to go on your back, just like you have that knitting waiting for you in the bag next to you in the waiting room or at a, a moment of uncertainty. Also knitting as a surfboard. So if you need to ride out those waves, if you're um, next to a patient in hospice and you really just need to find your footing by just simply focusing on that next stitch. And uh, wait, the waiting game can be really, really difficult. So just floating on that surfboard and floating along can be really comforting, um, just like knitting is to a lot of people. Also knitting as a water bottle. So this is a very portable craft that you can take everywhere and take small sips where, whenever you feel like it. Uh, I like to say that a row a day keeps the doctor away. And I know one of the questions was how many minutes a day do I need to knit to make it beneficial? And truly there is no limit or, or, or threshold for how much you need to knit. You can really almost immediately initiate what we'll talk about a little bit later on called the relaxation response by picking up your knitting and engaging with it. Uh, so it really doesn't take a lot, which is good news because I know that we are all busy and we are all engaged in so many different things. So. Also knitting as a shield, and uh, those of us in this world that are uh, introverted and feel like it's intimidating to enter a new setting or meet new people, a knitting group and entering a new setting with new people, knitting provides a very clear comfort barrier. It not only gives you sort of a clear bubble of space, but it also provides you an opportunity to have something to talk about. You can say, oh, I love that color of yarn, and it's really a great icebreaker. So it can really give you a sense of peace and well-being when meeting a new group of people or um, in a doctor's office when you're meeting a new doctor or a new nurse that it's a really easy way for them to comment on what you're working on and, and um, as an icebreaker too. So one of our board members also, I'm, I'm hoping I should add this in, she uses um, the metaphor of knitting as a doorbell. So the doorbell is you know, the opportunity to meet new people and build community is so immense. So we should really expand on the metaphors. I'm curious if you have any ideas on other metaphors or other aspects that um, appeal to you too. So feel free to pop that in the chat and we'll come back to that at the end as well. So 
outside of all of these, what, you know, what is knitting and how do we define it? Why would you choose to knit is a big question. And obviously, um, there are so many reasons why people um, seek out um, knitting as a comfort tool. And these two books, which were very recently published this year, Knitting for Radical Self-Care uh, by Brandy Cheyenne Harper, is really a wonderful overview with patterns included. And, and then Sutton Foster's How Crafting Saved My Life. And she's primarily a crocheter. Um, and I actually had the opportunity to meet her here in D.C. And we had a funny discussion about it really isn't the West Side story of knitters versus crocheters. That's not what we're up to, right? We are equal opportunity, uh, rhythmic crafters. So, um, so I think that one of the things about both of these book titles that stood out to me is they're very dramatic, right? How crafting saved my life. I mean, that is a really dramatic thing to say, or radical self-care. But when I really think about it, I feel that intensity. I feel that drama. And I, I do actually think that there are um, really extreme reactions when you are really keying into knitting. It really does make you feel like, um, geez, this really saved me in this moment. And uh, even though it sounds dramatic, I think it really did save. Um, and Sutton Foster's book is really more of a memoir that guides you through kind of her crafting journey along with her life changes and the points of transition that she went through. Uh, really a powerful message, I think. So all of these happiness chemicals, as I like to call them, are neurochemicals and hormones and neuroreceptors in your brain that are ignited by specific tasks that you might take on while knitting. So dopamine, the reward chemical. So if you complete a satisfying knitting project or if you even overcome a challenge, let's say something was giving you trouble and you had to tink back and you had to fix it, the challenge of overcoming um, really can release a giant dose of dopamine. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful. Um, and all of these neurotransmitters are so good for our health. And uh, serotonin being one of the most popular that you hear about all the time that can really stabilize your mood. So uh, knitting a repetitive pattern while gathered outside in a group. So the research says that we release more serotonin when we're outside and also when we're doing something rhythmic. So uh, endorphins, the painkiller. So creating something that's new and novel and uh, creating an artful freestyle design where you're going off the pattern and you feel like you're doing something outside of the box for you can really release the endorphins. And then finally, oxytocin, the love hormone. So having a sense of connection by giving away that labor of love uh, or giving away a compliment uh, and really connecting with others by sharing the sentimental nature of knitting, I think is really powerful. So some of the uh, research that um, you'll be connected to in the research bibliography is really harnessed by one core uh, researcher in the United Kingdom named Betson Corkle. And this is her book, uh, Knit for Health and Wellness, How to Knit a Flexible Mind and More. And it really is a great overview of all of the different research. She also has a great website, stitchlinks.com. And she talks about how, um, as an occupational therapist, she went through a lot of um, journeys with patients that were struggling with chronic pain and struggling to manage um, the complexity of their diagnoses. And they were able to use the very seductively simple task of knitting to help them overcome those challenges and the process of making things giving things and sharing uh, their knitting in community really helps them in that journey. So I, I find that uh, this book is also a great workbook. I have a copy that's all marked up in the edges and I can make notes. And so I'd encourage you to take a look if you're interested in learning her perspective on things. She also has what she calls the knitting equation. And I wanted to show it to you today where she digs in to 
all of the pieces behind why you might knit. So the patterns of movement, right? So we're bilateral, which means you're using both sides of your brain at the same time. Uh, very coordinated, so you're learning that dexterity is very important. Uh, one of the things that distinguishes knitting from crochet is that knitting is um, both bilateral and you're crossing the midline. So whereas uh, crochet, you're using one to dig those loops and so forth, knitting you're using both at the same time. So you're crossing the, mid the midline and um, the rhythmic motion being the most important part of that as well. Um, the hand position that you use and the opportunities to increase your personal space and provide that shield and that buffer, uh, the enriched environment. I mean, she just does a really great job of breaking down all of the different stimulating, enriching parts of sharing knitting with others. So that social engagement piece, uh, I think there's so much to that. And then the final big, big solid, I mean, she just bolds it right at the bottom. The final part of that equation being the portability of knitting. So there are so many arts and so many crafts that you can engage in, uh, but knitting is probably the most portable that you can do in just about any waiting room, uh, just about any context, really. Uh, so I know that I've been known to knit at the beach and the pool all summer long and um, you know the worldwide knit in public day is not so out of the ordinary anymore I think people are knitting in public a lot of the time I know there was someone at the US Open just last week um, Olympic athlete Tom Daly during the Olympics so it's really not uncommon at all at this point um, and a wide variety of people are um, engaging in this and inserting themselves in, somewhere in this equation so a survey done by another really great resource, the Craft Yarn Council, talked about uh, what are the benefits? What do you feel are the benefits to you when knitting? And I found this really fascinating that that feeling of accomplishment, so that dopamine release when you finish a project and you have a sense of accomplishment from creating and watching that fabric grow, 93% of the survey participants indicated that that was important to them as a benefit. Uh, 85 percent felt that it reduced their stress, uh, improved their mood, and their sense of confidence. I think those are all really strong factors in uh, figuring out what do you want your knitting project to bring you a sense of. Uh, this was a survey done by a, um, a psychologist in, in the United Kingdom named Dr. Mia Hobbs, and she has a wonderful podcast called Why I Knit. And that podcast really digs into what are the reasons behind what we do. And there are some universal truths behind it for just about everyone that she speaks with. And those are really listed here. So are you going primarily for a sense of challenge? Are you trying to try new things? And, um, and the difficulty of a pattern really matters to you. Or are you going for a sense of achievement? Uh, you want to create uh, 16 or uh, 16 hats, like the um, those that were delivered to us today by one of the nurses at MedStar for the babies in the NICU, right? So that sense of achievement that you've you've um, had an opportunity to create and um, mass produce those to um, make the biggest impact. So that sense of achievement could be really important. Or is it simply a sense of calm that at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day, it's an opportunity for you to recalibrate and recharge? Uh, I think it's really important to think about the power of that. Um, I, I like to think of knitting as meditating with my hands. Uh, primarily because I am terrible at regular meditation. So it is really an opportunity for me to gain the same benefits. And the research shows that our bodies are reacting in the same way to traditional meditation as they are to knitting which is really fascinating and, and a really wonderful opportunity for, um, for us to meditate with our hands. And then finally, that sense of joy, right? It can bring you a sense of coming together with a group, a sense of joy that you're able to share uh, and find a finished object. Um, so also what's most important was the second question that she asked. So the, finished, the finish line, the finished item, was that most important? 
or was the process in making it the most important piece? So I think it's really in interesting to think about those two aspects, right? Is it the process or the product? Uh, that's a uh, very common, uh, uh, there are many articles written about what's most important in your art process, uh, process or product. The creative expression and the sense of well-being and the psychological effects, but also the physiological effects that are mentioned um, at this link at the Foundation for Art and Healing. It's truly intense when you look at the research to think about we're reducing our blood, sh blood pressure, which has really great effects on our immune system, our overall brain cognition, and fighting inflammation. So there are multiple research outlets that have looked not just at knitting, but at other rhythmic crafts um, that really do benefit our, um, our overall sense. And I think that uh, one of the things that the Foundation for Art and Healing does, they do a great job of giving an overview of a lot of those uh, resources and tools. So one of the key aspects uh, to building and learning knitting is thinking of it as a skill. So you're not just engaging in a hobby or a craft, but you're really engaging skills that you can use and transfer to other parts of your life. Uh, so things like patience and perseverance, planning and partnerships, those are all pieces that are so crucial to what we do in so many aspects of our life. They're also very, those four key skills are very important when picking your next knitting project, when implementing it, choosing just the right colors and just the right texture of yarn that matches, and then overcoming that and persevering if it starts to be a little much and you're worried about finishing in time and really planning ahead on the time frame that you want to, to use and so forth is really, really important. And one of the most important aspects to knitting is the novelty of it. So when you're first learning and the health of our brain, according to the Global Council on Brain Health, they really emphasize that one of the most important things that we can do for the health of our brain is engaging in new novel activities. To really stimulate your brain, you need to find ways to engage in things that are new and different to you. And the best part about knitting is not only those of you that might be uh, thinking about starting to knit as a new skill, that's a great opportunity, but there's truly no finish line in the number of techniques, the different types of patterns, and um, knitting has so much novelty to it. You can always, always learn something new. And I think that learning a new stitch and a new pattern and a new rhythm to it is exactly what the Global Council on Brain Health is talking about, finding ways to engage in different aspects of your memory, and finding ways to um, that novelty being the most important. There's another word, neophilia, that talks about engaging in things that are new and different and engaging to you. So I hope that uh, knitting will become that for you. So one of the things that I think is so crucial to uh, when we organize our knitting and when we think about what, what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Uh, there's a great book uh, by Betson Corkle, the researcher I mentioned earlier out of the United Kingdom, and Lynn Rowe that talks about, um, that, well, the title is literally Knit Yourself Calm, A Creative Path to Managing Stress. And it has some wonderful patterns, and all of the patterns are divided into categories. And these are the categories. There's quick and easy, so those are very repetitive patterns that you could do while watching television or just simply trying to focus on something else. There are very portable projects, so it might be smaller yarn, easy to carry with you, uh, easy to tuck into the side of your suitcase if you're going on a trip. Group projects, so this is where everyone contributes a square to a blanket and you feel like you're engaging with a, um, with a group collective effort, which can be really powerful. 
big projects, which are long-term projects that you might have a lot of foresight into or something that you really want it to be a really large project so you can always have it there next to um, your favorite chair to pick up while you're reading an audiobook or listening to a podcast. So those big projects, um, I think, are really valuable for that. So giant blankets, and uh, there are so many opportunities for that. And then the final category are new skills projects. So those are the technical projects that you really have to focus on. I call them the, um, the behind closed doors, right? Mom needs a moment and she needs to be sure she's in a quiet space, really focused on the pattern. It might be color work. Uh, it might be counting uh, brioche. It could really be uh, the type of thing that you really, really have to concentrate on. And that's a whole different type of, of project. And I think most knitters find that they have many works in progress and they each of their works in progress might fit into one of these five categories. Uh, and I think that's a nice part to knitting. So it doesn't, it doesn't just have a one size fits all. You can really do a, a wide variety of different types of projects. So I mentioned earlier that everyone thinks about the, the, um, the planning process that we go through when we're knitting and um, when, we, when do we need to turn to our knitting. So we've planned out, we have these knitting projects, we've learned to knit. And one of the ways that um, knitting can be so powerful is at a moment of crisis when you might actually be feeling a fight or flight response. It could be anxiety. It could be um, anything that may trigger some sort of fight or flight response. Uh, Harvard researcher, Dr. Herbert Benson, uh, researched the, what he called the relaxation response. And the idea was that it would counteract the toxic effects of chronic stress, the chronic fight or flight response by slowing your breathing rate, relaxing your muscles, and reducing your blood pressure. And he had a very, very detailed process of what, what would it take to get you to that point. And um, there were, essentially, he broke it down into two essential steps. Um, and his technical process was, he was actually studying and um, going through the process of, of um, showcasing different uh, yoga, knitting. Um, knitting was actually mentioned mentioned in his obituary in February when he passed away, which I was so pleased to see because you hear a lot about his yoga research and his Tai Chi research out of Harvard, uh, but I was so glad that um, his obituary really highlighted knitting, so that means he really did care about that aspect of his research for sure. But those two essential steps include a repetition of a phrase, a sound, or a muscular activity. And knitting is that muscular activity. A phrase or a sound, that would be related to um, more primary meditation, uh, other things that may involve movement. Uh, but the repetition of muscular activity was knitting in his research. And then number two, a passive disregard for everyday thoughts and the return to your repetition. So the really key to this is that knitting gives you an opportunity to disregard those everyday thoughts and really focus on the next stitch and taking one stitch at a time. And as uh, Suzanne Cologne in this, um, this quote uh, um, in the Modern Daily Knitting article that she wrote, Suzanne Cologne is the founder of Med Knitation. And she talks about a design for living that she'll sit in silence and knit something very simple for 10 minutes. And it brings her back to a place where she can understand that while things around her may not be okay, she can be okay in that moment. So back to knitting as a surfboard where you can just float through and, uh, and, move, and move through recalibrating and reorganizing your uh, thought process for the day and reducing that fight or flight response. So I want to focus in on uh, really what are the key aspects to uh, knitting within the healthcare system. And truly, uh, Project Knitwell's foundation is working as 
um, just as artists do and um, all of the popularity of resilience rooms and hospital systems really caring about wellness plans, not just for their patients, but also for their caregivers, I think is really, really crucial. Uh, and one of the things that uh, this very recent PBS NewsHour um, program highlighted was artists working hand in hand with doctors to help with healing and to find ways to reduce the pressure that uh, the patients feel when they're um, when they're in need of a distraction or um, to escape from that particular mo moment what we're really building when we're interacting with patients and we're teaching them about knitting and we're showing them the texture of yarn and the colors what we're truly building is a connection most of all we're giving them the opportunity to focus on something other than their medical condition or other than what they may be what what stress or pressure they may be facing so um, in that particular segment jill sankey who's a researcher at the center for arts and medicine at the university of florida she talks about um, a social prescription. What would it mean if doctors recommended to their patients, just like they might recommend yoga or they might recommend other activities, what would it mean if they recommended knitting to their patients? And we worked in unison with them. And I think that is happening in a lot of hospitals where the artists will um, have referrals. We many times have nurses at um, Fairfax Sinova that will uh, refer patients that they think would be uh, receptive and excited to learn to knit with us. And um, I think that this is, is, um, is such an important concept for us to think about. Uh, the Craft Yarn Council way back in 2014, uh, they were focusing on, you know, knit one time per day. And this was sort of a funny piece that they added um, from the knit doctor, right? It's a prescription from the knit doctor. You know, side effects may include feelings of joy and relaxation and improved focus and accomplishment. Um, so I, I really do think that this is something that we could also take seriously. And it really is fundamental um, to what we're hoping to accomplish by sharing the benefits and giving people more insight uh, into why knitting is good for you and um, and why we think that it's accessible and an opportunity for um, for us to partner with the healthcare and arts and health is such a crucial aspect to uh, what you all are doing as nurses I think and reaching to connect not just with patients but also with caregivers is really crucial to us and in um, this study that's mentioned here that was published in 2016 uh, was conducted in 2015. We looked at a specific uh, compassion fatigue inventory and we had a group of oncology nurses that had a before and after knitting intervention and their compassion fatigue scores improved after knitting with us. Um, and I think that that's the power in what we are hoping to accomplish. And this pilot study, I hope, is just the beginning of what we hope to accomplish throughout, um, throughout our time. Um, and really one of the core missions that we have working with organizations like the National Organization for Arts and Health, NOAA, um, and finding ways to connect more. Um, and compassion fatigue and burnout is very, very significant and it's so important that we think about all of the aspects of what what can we do to help not just um, uh, prevent uh, the problem in addition to solving what's already going on so prevention and uh, those both of those pieces I think are really really key so to summarize, we always refer back to the top five reasons to knit. So fundamentally, knitting is therapeutic. Uh, the benefits to your mental health and uh, just simply having a stable mind at the end of the day or starting off the day fresh, um, I think that knitting really can provide those therapeutic benefits. Uh, and not just in a, um, a relaxing and uh, calming way, but also in, in, in literal reduction of, um, of blood pressure and opportunities to regulate our body and um, instigate those positive happiness chemicals and neurotransmitters. So the, um, the third one being knitting is forgiving. 
So one of the best aspects to knitting and really the next phase to our process in working together is finding ways for those of you that haven't learned to knit yet to learn that knitting is really a, such a fun craft to learn because even if you make a mistake, you can always unravel it or tink back. So knit spelled backwards is tink. And you can uh, find ways to uh, always, always fix those mistakes or integrate that mistake as a design element. So I could do a whole presentation just on common mistakes and how do we fix mistakes in our knitting um, is really a skill. So that's uh, that piece is really important. Knitting is also very, very creative. There are so many ways and so many different types of patterns and so many ways to combine stitches. So I have found that combining colors is one of the things that I am most passionate about. Uh, finding interesting combinations and the color theory work that I've done um, to learn more about that really is founded in uh, my background as a photographer. So working with um, uh, working with folks on a weekly basis, actually, we have an online uh, color theory series, and I hope that maybe that's something that we could engage uh, with this group as well. Um, and then obviously, number five, knitting can be very social. There's a great online community, very engaged. Uh, there's also a lot of opportunities to meet folks at your local yarn shop. Um, I feel like there are always, always welcoming opportunities to engage with the fiber community. And that's been throughout history. That is not new to, um, to the time window that we live in. It's really been um, a foundation to so many. Um, if you look at knitting throughout history, it's really quite remarkable. So I hope that um, I've given you a really uh, solid overview of all of the different uh, pieces. And I really want to give you the opportunity to click through to that research bibliography. Um, one of the things that you'll see on that Padlet is um, why should I knit is, uh, you know, what is all of those pieces that you can scroll through on the far left. Um, actually, let me stop my share and pull it up so I can show you. This is my contact information also. I'll bring this screen back around. And um, if you want to scan that particular QR code, go ahead and do that. I wonder if I can share both screens here. Let's see, I'll pull up the next one. So I think one of the best parts about uh, the Padlet is it's very interactive and I also have um, some of the directions and videos that we use uh, posted there as well. So if you want to get a jump start on um, the next step, which is really giving you direct knitting instruction, if you scroll over to the far left, um, this, uh, this link will give you the opportunity to sign up for Knitwell in the Cloud. And Maddie is going to help us coordinate that as well with this group, which is so wonderful. And I'm excited about that. Um, there's some basic knit stitch videos and so forth. But we have found that the benefit of being able to knit with someone live, with one of our expert instructors that can really help you and watch your hands as you knit is really key to that. So you'll see on, the, on this uh, Padlet, there's um, nurses and compassion fatigue. That's the study that I mentioned earlier. Uh, these are direct uh, research articles that are focused on specific knitting interventions. So knitting through addiction recovery, very powerful. Um, nurses that work in this field have probably seen how crucial it is for, um, for uh, folks that are facing addiction recovery to have a alternative outlet. Um, managing anxiety and eating disorders with knitting. Um, recently incarcerated women finding um, a source of job training. Uh, the Knit to Quit program, which is very popular in the United Kingdom. And I would really like to see more of that in the US. Um, Instead of a smoke break, you take a knitting break, right? It's the same tactile sensation. It fulfills a lot of the same urges um, in terms of the tactile piece. Uh, so I really think that there's a lot to that. Um, and then the other the other column over here, you'll see um, why knits. So we talked a little bit about the happiness chemicals and the relaxing to cope with grief. Uh, so I have a whole series of presentations on resilience and the research focus specifically on how um, knitting and grief and resilience are related. 
This is a great article specifically on how to be a better caregiver. So outlets for nurses and doctors to prevent that burnout and compassion fatigue, a really great overview article um, to combat cognitive impairments, to cope with chronic illness, and all of these are links. So you can click through and read those articles that are focused on that particular topic to improve mindfulness, to increase well-being, to combat loneliness. And this is one of the most um, compelling. I, I feel like the pandemic of loneliness is so intense right now. And um, the social isolation uh, that can be cured are really, are really um, at least helped through knitting circles and knitting groups is really immense. And that's one of the things that we find with many of the patients we work with. We're really giving them an opportunity to connect on a weekly basis when they come in for treatment. They have our knitter there to be with them uh, where they might not have anyone else that's that's available for them. So, um, And it allows the nurses to do the job that they need to do, but they still know that somebody is there with them and, and is keeping them comfortable company and um, teaching them a new skill at the same time. So relieving stress, uh, feeling less anxious, coping with pain, conquering addiction, uh, relieving corporate stress. So again, with the um, corporate burnout uh, and more articles about um, anxiety and sustaining brain health. So you could really spend hours digging into creating healthy communities and reducing cortisol levels. The research is really compelling, and I find that um, when I really dig into these articles and I learn more about the, uh, these aspects, I get, um, I get rather excited about it. So I hope that you'll dig in and, and do the same. But I want to open up for any questions that you might have or anything I can share more about in the chat. Um, Yes, Jennifer agrees that smoking cessation, I just think that that is such a powerful opportunity. Um, and it really does feel like that's a, um, a really nice piece to, um, to what they're already doing in the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is well ahead of us when it comes to their appreciation of knitting. <laughs> so I hope that we'll get there. Um, and maybe I see some heads shaking. Maybe we have some friends from the United Kingdom tonight. <laughs> Yes. Oh, that's a great question. So Alyssa's asking what the organizational structure of Project Knitwell is, and are we one location or a group of satellites? So that's such an excellent question because right now we are thinking about, uh, we're really in our adolescence as a nonprofit. So up until, um, or through the last 10 years, we have really been focused in the DC metro area and the hospital network and the system and um, the organization it really was founded on a powerful group of volunteers that were networked throughout this area. But we're very excited about the opportunity that we have to essentially train the trainers. So how can we have either chapters of Project Knitwell in other parts of the country? Uh, what would that look like? We're currently working with a consulting group out of George Mason University to determine uh, what would scaling in that capacity look like. And part of the reason for that is we have had so many opportunities, just like what we're doing here tonight, to connect with folks all across the world, uh, not just the nation, but internationally. And what can we do to help share our expertise and share our resources, our tools, our kits, our resource guide? Uh, what can we do to help share that um, with a broader network? So we've been sharing kits with the Stony Brook uh, Medical System in um, on Long Island. Uh, we have a Veterans Administration program out of Buffalo, New York. So we've already started connecting our resources to other areas, um, but that organizational structure is um, really, we're keyed into what will that look like? Like what do the next five to 10 years look like for Project Knitwell? And I get very excited thinking about um, those of you that I'm meeting here tonight could be some of our founding members of other Project Knitwell chapters throughout the world. Um, and that's really our ultimate goal. So um, I like the idea of thinking 
thinking of them as satellites, maybe chapters. Um, but we're really um, we're looking at what that might look like strategically and making sure that we can provide uh, the best possible outlets for more new knitters and fundamentally helping more people find the, uh, the network of the fiber community and the opportunity to benefit themselves. So college campuses, yes, that's an excellent idea. Um, start, you know, having those um, small groups on college campuses, I think there's a lot of power in that. And I have a lot of uh, background working in a number of different universities. So I'd be very excited about that prospect as well. Um, and I'd like that the group, the consulting group that we're working with at George Mason is um, partially professors and researchers and also uh, students. So they'll be able to give us more insight into that as well. So any other questions or anything I can tell you more about? I'm, I'm so excited that um, we'll have um, four more uh, meetings and four more opportunities to engage in the topics that you select, right, Maddie? They're, they're going to have the opportunity to give us feedback and, uh, and really choose what the next uh, part of this adventure is, right? It's like choose your own adventure knitting group style. So I'm excited to see what you choose. <laughs> Yes, I will just chime in there. Um, following tonight's event, within the next 24 hours, you'll get a post-event email with some of these resources, but in there, there'll be a survey. Um, and for the next four events, we are tailoring the topics to what you're all interested in. So within the survey, there's some um, pre-populated topics that you can select, or you can suggest ideas of your own. Obviously, you all may have things you're interested in learning more about. Um, and then Based on popularity levels, we'll try and tailor those next four sessions to the topics that you're all interested in learning about. So that'll be coming out uh, shortly to all of you, the survey. So feel free to fill yeah. that out for us. And Kristen had a great question about how to actually knit. So that, you know, really the next step, that's truly the next step for most of you that may not have learned to knit yet. And um, we have what we call Knit Well in the Cloud, which is one-on-one -on -one instruction, working with a, an expert instructor where we can see your hands and you can see our hands. And it's on your own time, which I think is wonderful, right? Because you are all busy, busy people with varied schedules. And I know nurses' schedules are especially complex. So um, that, is, uh, that Knit Well in the Cloud program provides you with a kit with everything that you need. Um, um, and provides you with the opportunity to um, to schedule with one of our volunteers on your own time. So um, I'm hopeful that that will be a really positive experience for you and an opportunity for you to um, to truly learn beyond just what you would find in videos or books. Uh, because sometimes it's easy when someone is watching your hands to really catch and make sure that you're following right along and uh, clicking on all cylinders as quickly as possible. So. So yeah, so that's another key step in this process. And I think uh, essentially that will be um, November, right, Maddie? Is that the, the time frame? Yep. So the next event um, will be November 7th. That again will be in the post-event email. So you can all see it there too if you don't have a pen to write it down now. Um, but that'll be the first of the four monthly sessions. So we'll have one November, December, January, and February, which is perfect timing for the cold weather. Who doesn't love to knit then? So it works out well. Absolutely. Uh, I'm particularly excited that we're meeting on the first, the, 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 well, almost the first day of fall, right? So that'll be uh, perfect timing for some um, uh, opportunities to, um, to cozy up with your knitting. And um, one of the best parts and one of the reasons that I think so many of our online knitting groups are so popular is we really love show and tell also. So I see quite a few of you knitting and um, I think that's such a great opportunity to, um, how many opportunities do we get for show and tell as adults, right? And knitting gives you that opportunity quite often. So, um, so I hope that our events will incorporate some more interaction as well. Beyond just questions in the chat, we'll have a chance to really interact and get to know each other too. So I'm excited. Oh, what do you do if you're left-handed? So we teach English style knitting, which means that lefties are the same as righties. So we are not worried. We're using both hands in a um, bilateral way and uh, you're engaging both sides of your brain automatically. So the left and right-handed instruction that we teach is identical for both. So 
Yeah. The nice part about knitting is it really does engage both sides of your brain. So um, it gives the uh, the right-handed folks of the world the opportunity to engage the you know the opposite side, and the lefties are um, are already benefiting from that most of the time. So. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you could join. I'm I'm excited too, and I'm I'm really hopeful that uh, this will be sort of the start of your journey with knitting and thinking about all the aspects of it. Uh, one of the best parts really is uh, learning from each other too. In the long run, there's so much to that. Um, and one of the things that I love to think about, and maybe those of you that are are already knitters um, can share with us, is you know, what is it that you love about knitting? And um, I really love uh, thinking through, these are quotes from a number of different folks that we've worked with. And I find that um, everybody has a different thing that they love about knitting. And maybe those of you that have already learned or maybe others can just forecast, what do you think you will love the most about knitting? Um, you could pop that in the chat as well. Um, it's so fun to think about um, what knitting brings us and the community that it brings us and the, the gift giving and the opportunity for handmade gifts is really precious, I think. All of us have those sentimental knits. Um, I have, um, I, I right, well, right off camera here, and uh, I have the first knitting project that I did with my grandmother. Um, I, I can show you, actually. It's sort of embarrassing how terrible I was. But she um, taught me to knit when I was in the fourth grade. Oh, let's see. I dropped. I dropped it. Oh no. Oh goodness. Sorry. I dropped. I dropped it down the stairwell. Oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. Well, she taught me to knit when she was facing cancer treatments, and it was very sentimental to me. And um, it it was. You can see where she. Uh, didn't help me anymore and I it grew into a triangle shape and it was really quite um, uh, quite unique but I'll share that with the, with the um, folks the next time so let's see any other questions popping up that I may have missed yes I got a couple questions about yeah post event things but yes um, I put it in the chat but just so everyone knows additional resources and information will all be in that uh, post event email and we will be recording sessions so if you're unable to attend any of those future ones, they'll be available to you um, as well. So don't feel like if your schedule doesn't allow you to join, please don't worry about that. We'll of course still share that with everybody. Yes. Um, well, I guess as we wrap up, I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us and thank you to Lauren um, for taking the time to share all of this with us today. Um, it was so wonderful to see everyone here, especially like Lauren said, some of you doing your knitting projects live here, which is very exciting. Um, but like I said, all of that information will be in the post event email. Please fill out the survey with your, uh, what you're interested in hearing more about in the future sessions. We're excited to see what you're all interested in sharing and learning about. So uh, please don't hesitate to fill that survey out. Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks so much for coming. Oh, I'm so glad you're motivated to learn. That's exciting to me. <laughs> yes, wonderful. Well, I'm so excited for next time also, so I'm hopeful. Yeah. Yes, all right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Take care.